as a Charles man um, I can't say he's one of my favorite fighters of all times because I never saw him really fight you know so he grew up with my uncle my uncle Ed he was the Cincinnati Cobra my uncle was Cincinnati Red and my uncle was a heavyweight like basically his whole life hunting truck driving you know so boxing was like secondary something they did just to make some money but they came up together once they was in Cincinnati and they used to call as a Charles Mac you know his family you know, Mac get on over here I guess Mac is his middle name so they used to call him Mac and once he started boxing professionally everybody stopped calling him Mac <laughs> They were just calling him the Cincinnati Cobra. So, all I could tell you is some of the things that I knew about him, that was told about him. But in the tournaments, like he fought in Chicago at the Golden Gloves, uh, all the AAU national championships, he won and he fought. This was a very important. The man fought as a featherweight in his amateur career. 42 and 0. And, and the amateurs. That is amazing because you know he ended up winning the heavyweight championship of the world. So, that tell you right there a lot about this guy. When he started off his, his amateur career, he started as a featherweight. That's incredible. To end up eventually winning the heavyweight championship of the world. That is just some amazing stuff right there just to even know about him. But he's the most underappreciated fighter, I think, of his era because of other people that they put in front of him. You hear a lot about Archie Moore, but he, but he dominated Archie Moore. You know what I'm saying? That's not taken away from what Archie did, but you're looking at a guy that, uh, that shoot, he did the same things. If not greater, he dominated these guys. And I'm saying he's the great light heavyweight probably in the history of boxing. If you look at it, if his uh, credentials of who all he beat, and then he was the one that, uh, that, of course, the Joe Lewis win was the biggest win in his career. But I'm saying, though, you look at the footage from this guy, his boxing ability is amazing. Like, he throws a stiff jab. When he throws a jab, it's stiff. With, like, power. And he wasn't a big guy. He was really small. But like my uncle said, man, like, what crushed him, because uh, my uncle was dating my auntie at the time. And my, they think they were here visiting in Chicago. And Ezra Charles was living in Chicago at the time. And they talk about like why Ed gave up boxing. My uncle was a truck driver, man. He was more of a truck driver than he was a boxer. Even though, you know, they were getting paid out of cigar boxes. You know, whatever the take was of the place, they got whatever percentage, whatever it was, they'll split it up with them. But it was, you know, cigar box money. And he was getting paid out of that. They'd come in the room and pay him. You know, Charles was talking about that time. He was like, man, they pay you right after the fight while you in the back right out the cigar box. <laughs> He's like, ain't no telling how much money they made from everything else. We just got our little piece and left. He's like, and, and down the road, we end up having tax problems and all kind of stuff. The stuff was popping up on him. But going back to his boxing, man, the guy felt like he was the best fighter in the world and he was proving it the only thing that basically laid out the ground print for him just giving up on boxing actually period is when he fought Jersey Joe Walcott for the fourth time because the third time he got knocked out and that was like an embarrassing thing for him at that time because he he got hurt then he just got caught with that shot and then they showed that more than anything in the world because he became the oldest heavyweight champion when he beat Ezra Charles but Ezra Charles 
basically got no credit for the beating him the first two times. And this guy wins one fight and he's already proclaimed and he's put on the top. So he came back with a vengeance. Like, okay, I'm going to come back and get my title back with a vengeance. So he won a couple of fights in a row, like two or three. I don't know how many they was. As you know, I'm not on box rec. And so he's ready to come and fight Jersey Joe Walcott again. And all of a sudden, the fight happens, and boom, they come in there and they they going at it. And the fight's going off, it's going good, and it's clear that he's winning the fight. Now this is what I've been told. I don't know for sure, but it was undoubtedly, without a fact, as a child destroyed Jersey Joe Walcott in this rematch. And the referee was paid off. That's the rumor that was going on. It was the first ref, black referee in a heavyweight title match in the history of boxing. So that's that's some trivia for some people out there. And all I know is that it was the worst robbery ever. I have no idea why they the judges they put out there on how they scored it and the way it went down, but it was clearly talked about as the biggest robbery at its time. And as it Charles at that time was being pinned, he would have been the first heavyweight to win back the world title. First heavyweight to ever do it. And he always felt that they wanted to reserve that spot for a white man. So he was really bitter about what happened. So after the next fight, I mean, after that fight, he was gone. Two weeks, two months later, he lost another fight to Lex Lane. I remember that. Then the rest was just, they were mediocre after that. They were mediocre fights against mediocre talent. And he was just fighting for a check, but he lost his heart for boxing. He was basically done. You know, he ended up with about what 20 20 some losses on his career after fighting over 100 plus fights he got like 20 some losses but majority of those losses came in the last couple of years of his boxing where he was out of shape he didn't train all he did was work with his uh like he had a blues band he used to play with he just worked on his musical instruments man and worked perform with his band and then he'll just go fight for some money why he go ahead and spend time traveling with his band. So, I mean, Ezra Charles gave up on the sport of boxing. He really did. Because he felt the sport of boxing gave up on him and didn't give him the respect it deserves. So for, for us, when we see a fight that don't go a certain way and we, we just forget about it and go on to the next fight, it stick with these fighters for years and years and years. And we see evidence of that with Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray Leonard. You can't even discuss the fight with Hagler without him getting back angry about the scenarios that happened after the fact. And it would have been just to him had he gotten a rematch and had the opportunity to right the wrong that happened. But by him not even getting the rematch as well, just to this day, it still bothers me. But I just wanted y'all to know a little bit about Ezra Charles. For those people going to say, who in the world is he? That's all I know really about him. Because, like I said, this is before my time. And I can't, this is why I don't do uh, greatest fighters of all time is Sugar Ray Robinson. And the great, second greatest is Ezra Charles. Uh, or the greatest one is Jack Johnson because I don't see how anybody would pass Jack Johnson if we were just going looking at stats and going back and nobody could pass Jack Johnson I just don't see how anybody could so if 
But it's hard because eras are different. A guy who lost 20 fights back in 1940 would probably be the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world right now. We don't know. You can't you can't put fighters in different eras, different scenarios all together. Different mind state. You know, it's t entirely different. So I'm out. Popcorn.